Thank you. As mentioned, I'm uh, John Grant, Director of Business Development at Intellia. Uh, thank you to the organizers for allowing me to speak today. I'm going to provide an overview of our company uh, pipeline platform and partnering focus. Um, so here's our, now we're a public company, here's our standard disclaimers for those of you who can speed read. So Intellia is the youngest of the CRISPR companies, although we've achieved a, a lot in a relatively short period of time. We were founded in 2014 um, by Atlas Ventures and some of the leading lights in, in the industry. Um, and we have a leading IP position uh, with IP licensed from the University of California at Berkeley, um, as well as the University of Vienna, and exclusively licensed to us uh, via Caribou Biosciences. Uh, we're proud to have a couple of really top-tier partners in the form of Novartis. Um, we have a collaboration with Novartis in the, in, in the CAR-T space and in the hemopoietic stem cell space, um, as well as with Regeneron in the liver. Um, it's been a busy year for us. We've raised uh, 170 million between our IPO and associated private placements, and we're putting this money to good use. We're, we're accelerating our our pipeline, bringing it uh, towards the clinic and towards the patients ultimately, uh, with the ambition to ultimately be a, a fully integrated pharmaceutical company. But we realize we can't do this alone, and we're seeking uh, partnerships, um, especially with companies that have expertise and capabilities complementary to our own. So a quick overview of our management team. We're led by Ness Birmingham, formerly a venture partner at Atlas Ventures, and he's assembled a team which span expertise spanning uh, biotech, pharma, um, and Wall Streets. So Tom Barnes has led drug discovery at a number of biotechs. Uh, John Leonard was formerly, um, our CMO was formerly CSO at AbbVie until he was plucked out of retirement by Ness. Um, Dave Morrissey is our CTO, and he was formerly at Novartis where he led the uh, RNAi program and uh, was, is really recognized internationally as a leader in the LNP field. Jose Rivera is our COO and chief uh, legal officer, and he was responsible for defending the Humira patent estate at, at Abvi. And Sapna Srivastava is our CFO and has a depth of experience um, on Wall Street. So I want to change gears now and, and focus on our, on our platform, uh, which is the, the beating heart, if you like, of Intellia. So there's two core elements to our, our platform, or, two, or two, two strands, if you like. On the, on the, on the right-hand side, we have the in vivo piece. Here we are uh, focusing a lot of our efforts on lipid nanoparticles, or LNPs. And, and the way this works, the, the CRISPR molecular machinery is packaged inside the LNP, and that's introduced into the patient and then homes to the, the organ of interest. We're initially focusing on the liver, which is where the LNP is naturally uh, home, and we have the ongoing collaboration with Regeneron there, um, but we're also exploring additional franchises in the eye, muscle, and, and CNS. Um, and we believe that LNPs may offer some compelling advantages over viral-based approaches in the ability... It, it, they, they may be less immunogenic, which may offer the ability to redose if indeed that's necessary. On the ex vivo side, this is a bit different. This is uh, cells that are removed from the body by apheresis, and uh, the CRISPR machinery is introduced into this cell by electroporation. You're effectively zapping the, the cell, and the, 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 and the machinery can enter through the, the pore, and then the cells are reintroduced, having incorporated their therapeutic modification back into the patient's. We have the existing collaboration with Novartis in CAR-T oncology and in hemopoietic stem cells, and we're also exploring applications beyond CAR-T oncology as well as in the autoimmune and anti-inflammatory space. So thanks, for, thanks to Deb, the last speaker, for helping me out with, with some of the CRISPR biology. For those of you who weren't um, at, at the last discussion, I'll just quickly summarize. So CRISPR-Cas9 can be thought of as a pair of uh, very precise molecular scissors that can, ha, can cut a very specific piece of DNA, and this in turn can affect three types of edits. There's the, the knockouts, uh, typically used for autosomal dominant disease, gain-of-function uh, mutations, 
Um, and for autosomal recessive disease or loss of function mutations, uh, typically repair um, or insertional replacement is used. We're exploring all three approaches, and I'll, I'll come back to that um, a bit later when I touch on our pipeline. So how do you take what is essentially an, an interesting academic finding um, and turn that into a platform? So we, we've, as you can imagine, spent a lot of time and effort developing our platform. And this is a busy slide, but there's, there's, there's three core elements to our platform that I want to emphasize. So the first is guide selection by um, means of uh, bioinformatics and subsequent guide qualification, uh, screening um, a, a vast array of guides uh, in vitro to select a, a subset which have the best editing uh, capabilities, best editing percentage. This subset is then subsequently um, used in the context of different RNA and nuclease formats to identify those guides um, with, with the best editing capabilities in the, in the in vitro and in vivo setting. And then on the right-hand side, this is uh, an important point. I think there's this uh, dogma within um, some of the field that CRISPR um, may have a higher rate of off-target events versus other um, editing modalities. Um, in our hands, we're routinely able to uh, obtain edits, uh, editing at a high frequency without any off-target events. And this is illustrated in the, the bottom right panel. You can see, um, trying to figure out the, so the, the arrows point to a couple of guides. Uh, the red dots indicate on-target events. Um, the black dots indicate off-target events. And so um, here there's two guides with, with no detectable off-target events above background. So one thing I think we're justifiably proud of at Intellia is the high rates of systemic uh, editing that we've been able to achieve. So this uh, example here on the left-hand side um, shows in vitro editing. You see the dose dependence um, editing rates there. As you'd expect, that tightly correlates with the in vivo editing rates, and we're routinely able to get north of 50 to 60 percent um, editing, which I believe is um, roughly an order of magnitude higher than has been uh, demonstrated by um, anyone else um, systemically. Um, and this, in turn, negatively correlates with the serum levels, in this case of TTR. Um, so here we see a reduction of 70% from uh, baseline levels. And this really is a testament to Dave Morrissey and his team, who've, who've put a lot of work and effort into optimizing our, our core LMP and um, CRISPR platform. We've had similar success on the ex vivo side. So here we're using electroporation. We're zapping the cells, and the CRISPR molecular machinery can enter the pores of the cells um, and become an edit and uh, affect the change within the, the cell itself. And then the cell becomes effectively the living drug. Uh, here we're able to achieve editing rates of 60 to 85 percent um, in this example using T cells. And these, these are biallelic edits, so knocking out um, both alleles of a given gene. Uh, reassuringly, we don't see the viability compromised very much, so we, we see uh, viability of 70 to 80 percent. What's been a neat finding is that when we try and go beyond single edits to multiplexing uh, more than one edits, we don't see a reduction in the rates of, um, of, of editing. So this is illustrated in the, in the bottom panel here. So um, so in, in, in this uh, fax display, you see 76% of cells have gene A knocked out. In this panel here, you see 80% 80, 80 of cells have gene B knocked out. And you'd imagine if, if there was no reduction in efficiency going from a single uh, gene edit to uh, a dual gene edit, you'd have the, the products or the multiplication of 76 and 80% um, when, you, when you target both genes simultaneously. And that's indeed what you do get here. So we're very encouraged by this. We feel this could have an advantage over um, some of the, uh, pr the more cumbersome, perhaps, uh, forms of editing and, and will really uh, has the potential to open up the, the, the various applications of um, gene editing in the ex vivo setting by being able to knock out multiple genes in parallel. So this is our pipeline, or at least what we've publicly disclosed of it. Um, so, and it also introduces this 
concept of sentinel indications. So a, a sentinel indication can be thought of um, an indication which is interesting in its own right, as well as uh, demonstrating once we've achieved um, levels to our satisfaction of, of editing within that uh, type of edits that will effectively open the door for um, other uh, indications which depend on the same kind of edit. So you know, it's not quite as simple as turning the handle, but uh, we feel that, that, that we can rapidly move other products um, behind uh, the, the first sentinel indication. So in, in this vein, transthyretin amyloidosis is a sentinel indication for the ability to do knockout at the relevant levels in the liver. Um, alpha-1 antitrypsin is a sentinel indication for, for doing repair, although we're also pursuing a, a knockout approach. Hepatitis B, um, obviously you want to have very high frequency uh, levels of knockout, and so we're, this is a sentinel indication for high frequency um, knockouts to, to really reduce the viral particles in, in the liver. And we're pursuing a number of inborn errors of metabolism um, via uh, insertional approaches as well as uh, knockouts and repair uh, as well. What we've publicly disclosed is we will uh, select one to two indications, uh, one, one to two uh, development candidates rather that will advance into IND enabling studies into the, in the latter half of 2017 or first half of 2018. And at the bottom of the slide, you see the, the indications that we're, the, the approaches that we're progressing in, 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 in consort with uh, Novartis, and we expect the first IND to be filed uh, as part of that collaboration in 2018 um, in the hemopoietic stem cell program. So here's the, the requisites partnering piece of the, the talk. So this uh, sort of dartboard, if you like, um, the, the inner circle, the bullseye, reflects our immediate near-term focus. That's in uh, knockouts or non-homologous end-joining type of edits, uh, single edits. And on the therapeutic side, we have the, the, the main focus in the liver, but we are actively exploring, um, expanding into CNS, muscle, and, um, and the eye as well. Um, and on... Uh, uh, on, on the ex vivo sides, um, we're also uh, focused very much with our partner Novartis on CAR T therapy in hemopoietic stem cells, but exploring um, other applications in non CAR T oncology and autoimmune and anti inflammatory disease. Just to put this a bit more explicitly in terms of um, encumbered and unencumbered areas, so you know, as mentioned already, we're working with Regeneron in the liver and with Novartis in the um, HSC and uh, CAR-T space, um, but we're open for partnering in the CNS, eye, um, and muscle um, spaces, as well as the non-CAR-T oncology um, and autoimmune and uh, inflammatory disease um, spaces. And we, we've actually formed a division, Holyones by Intelia, called Extelia, um, recognizing some of the different challenges that ex vivo cell therapy faces um, so that this group will specifically focus um, on the ex vivo um, uh, diseases. And so what are we looking for in terms of partners? Well, I ideally, uh, companies who have expertise and capabilities complementary to our own and who absolutely share our vision to bring novel therapies uh, to the patients. So that's it from me. Um, I'm around for the duration of the conference, so I look forward to meeting many more of you, and my contact details are there. So thank you very much. I'll take questions afterwards.